Lord. I was thinking of that, that song that says, uh, I worship you because of who you are. We can thank God for what he's done, but we can worship him even if he didn't do anything. We worship him because of who he is. Uh, tonight, I'm going to start a four-part series. Uh, same subject for all four parts, just looking at it in different direct, uh, different ways. Now, everybody here knows this. Everybody here has heard it all, but uh, Brother Lopez and I decided that it's been a while since we went over basic doctrines, so we're doing it now. Uh, if you have any friends, please bring them the next few weeks because we'll be going over this subject, which if they're not born again, they need to hear it. They need to see it in the Word. So um, even if you own a house, you have to work on the foundation sometimes. We point it, look for cracks and so on. So we're going to work on the foundations for a few weeks. And uh, all of this is going to be postulating um, John 3, 3 to 5. You must be born again. You must be born of the water and of the Spirit. And Acts 2.38, when Peter gave it to the people, um, that you're baptized in Jesus, repent, baptize in Jesus' name, and you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. So postulating that, we're going to see if the scriptures back that up as New Testament salvation. So the four weeks, the four studies, uh, and each of these could be more than a week. I could put all of this into one week, but it would be, it would be weak. It would be uh, too fast. Um, first one is uh, Old Testament types and prophecies about New Testament salvation. The second one is what Jesus taught about escaping sin's consequences. The third is New Testament salvation actually happening in the book of Acts. And the fourth lesson will be on uh, what the writers of the epistles said about the people in church, how they got saved, and the benefits of getting saved. So from four different directions, we're going to be proving uh, Acts 2.38 is New Testament salvation. All right, so tonight we're going to go with the Old Testament version, or look at it. So in the Old Testament, this is a big, big picture, we learn of sin and its consequences. We're not just animals, but we have the knowledge of right and wrong, and we find that there is consequences for doing wrong. Uh, the law, the Old Testament books, was a schoolmaster to show us about God's perfection and what it would take to be with him again since we were separated. Uh, Galatians 5 says, Wherefore the laws... The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So we in the New Testament aren't under the schoolmaster, aren't under the law, where we obey the law to get to heaven. Uh, we are under the, the law of, of uh, grace and by faith. Uh, now, back then, the law contained three group categories of, of commands from God. The civil laws, which dealt with man versus man. My ox killed your ox. What do I owe you to, to make up for that? Those kinds of laws. The moral laws, that I put as man versus himself or man with himself. How do, how do I stay, even in, without any of you, how do I stay right with God or right with myself? And then the ceremonial laws were laws that God gave all the people, uh, the Jewish people, to how they would relate to him. And that was all ceremonies and sacrifices and buildings and uh, these kinds of appearing before him and, and bringing offerings and so on. Now, the moral laws showed us holiness before God and how we are in need uh, of a sacrifice due to our failings. Holiness we cannot attain in our flesh. No man can. And so we find out that we fail. And that shows us that we have a need for a sacrifice for that failing. Uh, the ceremonial laws showed us how God wants us to approach him uh, and how he wants us to cover our failings because he's not, he hasn't given up on us. 
And the ceremonial also, uh, laws also showed us a type of God's ultimate way for us to be with him. Remember, we have to be separated with him because of sin. He can't be in the presence of sin. And uh, he is going to have an ultimate way for us to be with God, the new covenant, which we talked about, of grace and the perfect sacrifice. So in the Old Testament uh, writings, we find uh, types, figures, prophecies, uh, words written about uh, four subjects here, atonement, uh, repentance, death, the blood sacrifices, the ways that we approach God. How do we break that barrier? How, how do we cover our sins so that we can have something to do with God? Uh, second, it shows us a Savior would come, the ultimate sacrifice that a Savior will come. So it predicts uh, the Lord Jesus coming. Third, it shows us baptism. Now, I always think of uh, Nicodemus when I, when I read this, uh, we talk about it in the Old Testament. Jesus said, how come you don't know this about being born of the water and born of the Spirit? How was he supposed to know it? Because God had already showed it to him in the Old Testament. God, God put it out there in types and figures. So we'll look at that. And uh, lastly, uh, that he was going to pour out his Spirit on people, that we were going to have something to get us through this life. We're going to have the Spirit. So spirit, the main thing is when we receive his spirit, we have the power to walk victoriously even though we're still in the flesh. And secondly, when we pass, we have the power to rise again. So he, his intent was to give us his spirit. That wasn't in the Old Testament. That was to come. So let's look at... The first one, prophecies of the figures of atonement. There's going to be a lot of scripture here. A lot. I won't have to teach much. The, the Bible will teach us. God's law demands that blood be shed to pay for or cover sins. It starts in Genesis chapter 2, only the second chapter. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. And the eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So they tried to cover themselves. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. So they, they tried to cover themselves. It wasn't good enough. God gave them coats of skin. Where did he get the skin? Killed, killed an animal, sacrificed an animal, so blood was shed. They had something to cover them. They died. They they were under their relationship with, with uh, God, but they had, they had sinned and God had made a way for them to have uh, some time uh, cover, covering their sin. Notice it says it co covered them, it didn't take it away, it just covered it. Hebrews 9, uh, talking about the Old Testament, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. So this is, this is the atonement. This is the, the way that God had set up in the law of how to cover or get rid of sin. Back to Exodus. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doors posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And the blood shall be unto you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This is a something that happened in the physical. They didn't know what it all meant. If they obeyed it, God passed over them. If they didn't, God didn't pass over them. But to us, this is a picture of how the blood kept them from being destroyed. And that is not just a story. It was written for our admonition. Leviticus 1 to 3 to 4, one more example of how the Old Testament shows this atonement. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, and he shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. So this is the time when they had the tabernacle at the front door. And in a few minutes, we're going to act this out. But at the front door was a, an altar with fire and the priest and a man could bring voluntarily an animal, sacrifice it, put his hands on it, and that sacrifice would cover his sin for the time being. 
for uh, a certain amount of time. So these examples are just a few of the ones that show that this is the approach to God. Now in the Old Testament, that's all they had. We'll get to the New Testament and see how it's, it's changed and perfected. So another prophecy of the Old Testament that is uh, needed for, for our New Testament salvation study is that there were prophecies of a savior to come. I got five examples here. You know how many there are examples of uh, prophecies of Jesus coming, but let's just go hit five of them to be sure and build a solid foundation. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This was in uh, Genesis chapter three, after Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit were found to be uh, sinning against God and God was pronouncing judgments. And during the judgments of the earth, the woman, the man, and the serpent, he put in one line here, giving a future look that there would be a seed of woman that will bruise the head, even though the serpent will bruise the seed's heel. So the serpent will hurt the seed of woman, Jesus, but Jesus will destroy his head. So that's a, a proto-evangelium, and that's the first. I don't think it's the first. I think uh, when a man shall leave his parents and join to his wife, and they shall be one flesh, Genesis chapter 2, one chapter back, he, he instituted marriage, which is his ultimate goal, is to bride the bride of Christ, marriage with his people. So I, you can see, you can see uh, salvation and these subjects many, many places. So a second place, just to pull out uh, where they talked about a savior coming, uh, was um, in Genesis 22. And Isaac spake to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. So this is the passage where... Uh, Abraham was being tested. Would he give up his son? Very picturesque of would God give up his son? Um, but Abraham was being tested. And his answer, um, I think it says, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. I really believe that that just means that God's going to provide a lamb for this offering, which he did. In the next verse, he said there was a ram caught in the thicket. And they sacrificed that instead of Isaac. However, the way it's written in the English is beautiful. God will provide himself a lamb. And if you want to read it that way, and if you think maybe God had it translated that way in the English for hundreds of years, for billions of people, it's okay. Because God did provide himself the lamb. He didn't get another animal like he did with uh, Abraham. Another place in Genesis talking about the coming Savior the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That's interesting. It's one line with one word, Shiloh, and that's it. It doesn't talk about it before or after that verse, but it just puts that mention in that until Shiloh come. In other words, it must have been always pretty known that a Savior was coming. Uh, the Jewish people... All, all through should have been waiting for the Savior, and, and they were, and maybe still are. Um, one last one. Nope, two last ones. Le Leviticus 6, 8 to 10. We covered this a few weeks ago, I remember. Um, and Aaron shall cast lots upon two goats, and one lot for the Lord, and one lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Beautiful story. We talk, we, we all use scapegoat in, in our language, especially when you got kids getting in trouble and if you get out of something, you're a scapegoat. Uh, but two goats, one was sacrificed and the other one got to go free. Okay, a beautiful picture of it. One was sacrificed, Jesus, so that we get to go free. Isaiah 9, 6, 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever and ever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Not necessarily talking about Jesus the sacrifice, but that a son is going to be born to us. So that's just five examples of how the Old Testament predicted what's going to be in the New Testament. Now, let's get a little more detailed here. Prophecies and types of water baptism. So remember, we postulated that water baptism was part of salvation process in the New Testament. Is it in the Old Testament? Well, found four examples. There's probably more. Uh, remember, two or three establishes a, a fact according to how God wants us to look at his word. So the first example is Noah's Ark. Um, Genesis chapter 6, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Okay, so there's, there's a punishment in the physical sense. He's going to destroy everybody. No more humans at all. But he told Noah, Make thee an ark of gopher wood, Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. So he's having Noah make a way out for himself. And then dropping down to 17, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, Thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And Noah was saved as he went through the waters of the flood. So one example of going through those waters, he went through the waters, but he came out on the other side. So uh, in a sense, the boat saved him through the waters. Also, I want you to notice that uh, what they're supposed to do with that, that uh, ark, they were to pitch it within and without with pitch little bonus that word pitch means repentance funny not funny but. so inside and out of the ark was covered with repentance okay. we'll see that again Moses is Moses was saved through water also Exodus 16 and he said all right this is Pharaoh talking to the uh, wives when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools if it be a son then you shall kill him but if it be a daughter, she shall live. Kind of reminds me of the China one child. Hopefully that's no longer I heard. Um, so in chapter 2, and when she could no longer hide him, she took him, this is uh, Moses, and made an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch. Again. And put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river bank. Brink. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. And she raised him as her child. We know that story. I'm not going to go into the story. But Moses was destined to die. And yet he went through this little boat, daubed with pitch, into the water, brought back out of the water, and he lived. He became uh, the leader of, of Israel out of Egypt. So Moses was saved from death through the waters of a river. Third example from Exodus. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out from this place, and there shall no leavened bread be eaten. So they left Egypt, a place that was not godly, and they were slaves after those 400 years, and they left, and they, they got out. But the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, encamping by the sea beside 
whatever, before whatever. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So, he marched them up. Let me give four people. Uh, Maria and Jeremiah, Stuart and Mark, and Shane. <laughs> okay, so first, you can just stand in a row here. You can face that way. Oh, you can face that way. Jeremiah. Okay, Jeremiah, um, you're going to be right here. All right. Now, Jeremiah is going to represent the cloud. And uh, Sister Marie is going to represent Israel. Mark, he looks like it, is going to represent the Egyptian soldiers. And right here we have the Red Sea. God, God has led Israel to the brink of the Red Sea with Egypt following them. And Egypt is a type of sin. And so that sin is following Israel as he tries, Israel tries to get out of Egypt. And God has led him here. Now, let me read the scripture. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show unto you today. For the Egyptians, whom you see this day, ye shall see them again forever. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wing all that night, and made the sea a dry land, and the waters divided. So step back, see. And the Lord, uh, it's the next, next set of verses, the Lord switches places. So switch place with Israel and get between. Now the Lord is between Israel's <laughs> sin and Israel is now going to march and march right past the Red Sea. Now the Lord, let's go, go, go back with Israel, stay with Israel. And now bad old Pharaoh wants to get them, so he enters here. And then the water comes and takes them over. All right. So now that's that's how it happened. Now notice in this example, you may sit down. Thank you. But I'll need you one more time. Right. In this example, we're looking at the water of baptism. So they went through the sea, the water, to escape sin, and he called God called that the salvation of Israel. That they went through that. That whole thing was put down here. The next hundred years, I don't know how much history was written down. This was so important because this is a type of New Testament, us going through the waters of New Testament. So now we've seen Noah go through the water. We saw Moses go through the water. We've seen Israel go through the water. Or, or, um, the Jewish people go through the water. And each time they had condemnation or they had punishment raining on them. Noah was going to die in the flood. God was killing everybody. Moses was going to die because he was a male baby. Israel was in the bondage of, uh, stuck in the bondage of Israel. They're going to, in, in Egypt, and they were going to uh, stay there and live and die there. So that's, that's three examples where they went through water, but it was part of salvation. So they, sh they should know, Nicodemus should know that there would be water involved. The last example uh, is that the tabernacle, the last example I'm going to talk about. Remember, this is about the water. This is about the water baptism. The tabernacle is a type of New Testament sal salvation. Water is involved with the approach to the Holy of Holies. I need you four again. I'm not going to get to sleep. Okay. While you come up here, you can get in the line the same way, whoever wants to be first. Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. I didn't read the scripture, but what we have here is the altar where the people brought the burnt offering that we just talked about for the salvation. They put the hand on the head and it was the atonement for them. This is the altar where they burned the animals. This is the labor that God said to put between the altar and the tabernacle of the congregation, or the Holy of Holies. And <laughs> this 
is in the Holy of Holies. If you want to hold up your arms, we could have the uh, candles, the uh, showbread, and the uh, the the altar for incense. So it kind of makes a cross if you want to think of it that way. So it's all in a row. People enter through making a sacrifice. This labor, I don't know what this labor of water is for, but they want to get to God. All right. So what does it say about the labor? Thou shalt also make a labor of brass and his foot also of brass to wash with all. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. Okay, so that's where Aaron was supposed to wash his feet and his hands. Now, what does it say? When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, that's in here, they shall wash with water that they die not. So had they skipped that water and went into the presence of God, they, it says they would die. As a matter of fact, or when they come near to the altar of the minister to burn offerings made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and feet and that they die not. A second time he says that you will die if you skip that. And that shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So thank you again for making this picture. I may have you up one more time. So, <laughs> uh, so again, we see water. We see our approach to God. We see we're back in the back there with, that, uh, with sin. <laughs> There's a sacrifice that's made, there's a washing that's done, and then we reach God. And again, thinking of Acts 2.38, we're thinking the, the repentance is where the, the sacrifice was made, the labor was where water baptism was, and the Holy of Holies is where we enter the presence of God. And remember that, that, to, that uh, wall thing was torn so that we had access to the presence of God. So again, a fourth place where sinful man could make an approach unto God, except all of these were figures, types, ceremonies. They didn't actually take anybody's sin away, but they were ways that God was showing us. We're so blessed to be in the New Testament, not the Old Testament, to understand what we do know. Um, now, it doesn't mean that they aren't going to be saved. They're, people are saved through faith, and they had faith to do that and not skip the labor. They be saved, I believe, that they, they, they are saved. They're saints from the Old Testament. The New Testament, again, we're, we're saved by uh, New Testament salvation. So cleansing at the labor with water allowed them to approach God in the holy place. Without the washing in the water of the labor, they would die. So be very careful if you skip water baptism in Jesus' name. Yes. Prophecies of the infilling of the Spirit. Oh, let's see. I guess I don't have to have you up here. Imagine they're up here, and we have Marie, the children of Israel. Marie, the children of Israel, and God gets on the other side of her. So it was a cloud. So the cloud was on one side, went on the other side. You can't actually demonstrate that here, but in that they went through the cloud, and then they went through the water, water and spirit. And uh, let's just read it. And the Lord went before them, pillar of day, by a cloud, and lead them in the way, and by night, a pillar of fire, to give them light to go by day and night. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. That's where, that's, that's where God kind of puts himself. It's, it, you know, imagine a person's coming to church. God is cutting them off, putting a hedge, getting between the person that's coming to him and, and his, his Egypt that's following him and, and his, his troubles. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud, and it was darkness to them. That's another interesting thing. To the people of uh, Egypt, even though it was day, they saw the cloud as darkness. And that's kind of like the people in the world. You know, they see us go to church, and it's crazy to them. They, they don't understand it. They, it's darkness to them, but it gave light to those by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. God keeps us for a time. And then 1 Corinthians 10, so that 
Well, let the apostle say, apostle Paul say what this meant. Moreover, brethren, I would not have that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So he's tying it directly to baptism and that ties to Acts 2.38, which ties to born of the water, born of the spirit. So the Old Testament is really backing up what, what we postulated is New Testament salvation. Now, I want to look at uh, the fourth one. The prophecies of the infilling of the Spirit. So is there anything prophesying that or um, figures of the infilling of the Spirit that we have? Well, certainly I was looking today, many, many people were moved on by the Spirit, and the Spirit was in them. Cunning laborers, leaders, prophets, Prophets, even bad people sometimes move, were moved on by God. But not all the people. God didn't pour his spirit on all flesh. He, he poured his spirit when he needed to. So we're going to look at the prophecy of the infilling of the spirit upon all flesh. So the first one uh, was the cloud that we just acted out, that uh, the people went through the cloud, and that's a type of born of the spirit, receiving the Holy Ghost, being filled with the spirit. Joel Plano said it. And, and I looked through the Bible today, and I couldn't find a better place for saying exactly what God planned to do than Joel. And apparently Peter didn't, because that's what he used as his text when he preached on the day of Pentecost. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. I got a question for brother, brother Jeremiah. I haven't heard it preached, but it says your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. In my mind, it's kind of the other way around as the young men have dreams and the, the older men see visions. So it'd be interesting to look into that and find out what, what exactly. Well, I feel young because I, I see visions. Okay, all right, everybody see visions. <laughs> Well, it's it, it's something that I, every time I read it, I think I gotta I gotta figure that one out. Um, okay, so that that was the straightforward. I will pour out my spirit. Let's look at just a few others. Um, this case here, we're talking about God's written word. The first time He wrote the words, He put it in those tables of stone. The second time, after Moses broke the stones, Moses put it in the stones and He carved them Himself. This time, he has a plan to put those laws in our heart. Jeremiah, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So that's his plan for the new covenant. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, for as much as you have manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. When we receive the Holy Ghost, we receive his ways in us. He put it in us as opposed to us reading it. So that's one example, or two examples, uh, Joel saying it directly, Jeremiah and uh, um, Paul putting that together, saying about uh, the writing. Uh, here's one, the breath of God. Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed unto his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Well, two chapters later, man died. He, he lost that living soul part. And John 20, 22 said, and when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And I put in here in parentheses, and they became alive again. And I'll always remember God gave me that, that message that, that time that I brought the box and it said, uh, life, God brought life. And there's a song, I never realize now that there's a song, he brought life, I'm happy he brought life, it's in a minor key. Uh, that was a, a revelation to me is that we were dead and he brought life back to us. It's not just, you know, forgave our sins, but he put life, we're alive now and the people that we minister to are not yet alive. There is a big difference. It's not just I believe something, 
but he has put life back in us. We're back like Adam before the fall. And lastly, for tonight, um, another example of his sport, spirit poured out. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerer shall be ready to speak plainly. Now for us, that's the stammerers. Earlier in this, or earlier, later in this book of Isaiah, he talks about people with stammering lips. We're not going to go into that tonight, but the, the apostles, or the Paul, referred back to that and saying that was a speaking in tongues. So if that was a speaking in tongues, then this stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. Could be like, you know, okay, we're the stammerers, the stammerers of, of Morana, and we're ready to sp speak plainly about the truth of God. So uh, verse 15, until the spirit be poured upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field and the fruitful field be counted for, uh, for us. Until the spirit. Isaiah 44, 3, For I will pour water upon them, him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. So it's in the new covenant, it's always been God's intention to fill people with the Holy Spirit. So now all we've done there is looked at the Old Testament to, to prove or to confirm us that Acts 2.38 was prophesied and given in types numerous times so that we can be we can be sure about that however in the next few weeks we have jesus teaching us directly god himself directly teaching us and then what happened in the book of acts are so exciting to look at those examples again and finally what people don't look at very much i don't see is all the places in the letters where they refer back to the new birth experience Almost every letter refers back to born of the water, born of the spirit, speaking in tongues, all kinds of things. So it's going to be exciting, especially that fourth one, I think, because that's our time, the, the, the letters. Praise the Lord. Amen. Bless you. Brother Jeremiah, if you want to close. Yeah. Well, this is um, a lot of information, but very well presented. And uh, share it on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, do us a favor, share it. Uh, the question is always, how do you get to heaven? And uh, the best and the only thing that should explain it is the Word of God. And he has his people, his preachers, his teachers teach it. And, um, and, the, and, and review it for yourself as well, because this is, this is really good. And uh, so if you're able to share on Facebook, please, please do so. Share it on your page. Uh, if you're on Facebook tonight, uh, if you have any questions, let us know. We have our phone number there. And uh, if you have any questions here, see Brother Van Allen. All right. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Uh, bless.